So uh, let me introduce the first speaker of the afternoon session. This is uh, Yain Tsepekova. The title of uh, her talk is uh, Substructures in Graphs. Um, next to my first speaker. Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I used the time before the talk to, get, to find the good markers and uh, draw this picture because it's a lot of algebraists and a lot of algebra functions. And during the talk, I used, the, I used the, the phrase graph decomposition, which is a very simple thing, but I feel like people's brains might go into something really complicated when they see it, because they don't define it specifically. So when I talk about graph decomposition, all I mean is into subgraphs. All I mean is that the graph's edges are split into disjoint subgraphs. Like it's not really, it's a, it's a set union, like in high school. Um, so you see the title of the talk, I'll just tell you maybe how it's going to go. Um, I'll start by reminding you about graph theory and what it was. Hopefully everyone did a course of that at some point in their life. Um, then I'll tell you about the main philosophy of extreme graph theory is kind of a subfield that I work in. And what kind of questions we find interesting, what kind of stuff we study. And then because, because the talk is called substructures in graphs, right? I'll, I'll survey some extremal results on substructures in graphs. Um, and there will hopefully be stuff you've seen maybe in your youth or something. Um, and then following that, I'll use two problems that I've worked on during my PhD to try and illustrate, as best I can, two methods from our field that I think are really cool and that I use a lot. Um, so there will be some proofs in, in the slides. I know it's a bit unconventional. Yeah, so we start with the definition of a graph, which hopefully everyone knows. So a graph consists of a set of vertices, so there's this stuff here, um, and a set of edges, which are just under, uh, unordered pairs of vertices. And there are different kinds of graphs that we can see in the literature. They're called directed, oriented, they could be weighted, they could be multigraphs. You would have seen bits of this. Uh, they all have to do with the space where the edge set lives. So if the edges are ordered, we normally draw arrows for them, and you would have seen that in life. Um, and these graphs are directed or oriented. So it all has to do with where I choose my edges to be, but this definition is the most common one, and it's the definition of a symbol graph. Now graph theory studies properties and parameters of graphs and the relationships between them. So here are some examples of of such things you might have encountered. We have things like minimum and maximum degree of a graph. Is that okay with everybody? Hands up if someone doesn't think that's okay. Good. Um, there's, thing, there's things like planarity of graphs, that again goes into undergraduate courses. Uh, there's graph minors. Um, there's things like bandwidth. That, that might be something people wouldn't have seen, but it doesn't matter. I won't talk about it. Um, and there are things like spectral properties of the adjacency matrix of the graph, which goes towards algebraic graph theory things. Um, and here's a first exercise in graph theory that a student might be solving in their homework. Um, it's, uh, for example, to show that each graph has two vertices of the same degree. And if you get lost or bored during the talk, you can try and do it. Um, there will be more of these. Now, extremal graph theory, if it has to be summarized with one sentence, is uh, the study of extrema of graph parameters subject to constraints. So, for example, we could, I use the laser, we could ask how many edges can be in a graph on n vertices without triangles. So the edges are the graph parameter that I'm extremizing, and then the constraint is that the graph has no triangles. And here's some maths notation for the same thing. So I want the maximum of the set of edge counts as the graph goes a roll and graph that graph the triangle. I could write some math rotation for this. Um, here's the, ah, I should point to that one. Um, here's this, the same thing from the previous slide. By the way, the answer to this is that n spread on 4, and it's probably a first theorem one sees in a graph theory course. It's called Manto Serum, it's quite old. Um, and there is a unique graph that, that attains this bound that has exactly this many edges but no triangles. It looks like this. It's what is known as the complete bipartite graph. Are these words that are ringing bells for people? This is stuff you've seen in school. 
Thanks. I actually nominated that person there to not other <laughs> same things. Um, it's the complete bipartite graph, and I denote this by KN half and half. And you can see from the picture what it is. And in extreme graph theory, we not only care about proving that certain extreme are equal to la, but also what graphs attain those bounds that we prove, such as this one. Um, and if I go one level up from triangles to this little guy, so this is the complete graph of four vertices, that's this one, that's denoted by K4, and you can probably extrapolate for the rest of the top what K5 and 6 and so on. Um, it, it also holds that the maximum number of edges in the graph that's free of K4s is n squared over 3. And if I go up to K5, I get 3n squared over 8. And if I complete the sequence, I arrive at Turan's theorem, which is the second theorem in a graph theory, of course, giving the maximum number of edges in an n vertex graph here of 3 of Kr's. So complete subgraphs of R vertices. And it's this. As was before, uh, there's a unique graph that attains this. And in extremal graph theory, we call this an extremal example, and in this case, we have a unique one. That's not always the case. Um, this is a little aside that I give at the beginning, so I don't have to clarify things. So note that the maximum number of edges in a graph with no triangles. Trying to find this quantity is kind of the same as finding the minimum number of edges forcing the existence of a triangle, that those are two views of the same bound. So for the rest of the talk, when I talk about conditions forcing the existence of substructures and graphs, rest assured that these are extremal questions that I'm answering from this kind of equivalence. Um, today I'll mostly talk about degree conditions, that is minimum degree on state in graphs. So minimum degree conditions the existence of large substructures in graphs on n vertices. And in extremal graph theory, n always goes to infinity. So we always look at stuff for larger n. Um, none of the substructures we saw so far, like triangle, k4, none of those were considered large uh, compared to the size of the graph. And for today's talk, there are two ways in which a substructure can be large. Um, it can be what we call a spanning substructure. And that's when it covers all the vertices of a graph. So for example, a Hamilton cycle, which you might have encountered, which is a cycle traversing a whole graph. So that's large to me. Hands up for Hamilton cycles. OK. Um, another way that a substructure can be large is if it has quadratically many edges. So this is what I call dense. Um, so we have like order and square edges. For example, a collection of many edges join Hamilton cycles. And by many, I mean linearly many. Um, and by the way, in the latter case, when we're looking for a dense substructure, finding that even in the complete graph is not trivial. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give an example just now about Hamilton cycles. So here's, um, here's a complete graph and a Hamilton cycle in it. But if I want to find a dense collection of edge to join Hamilton cycles, in that graph it's not clear, here's the one Hamilton cycle in blue, it's not clear what I would do to it to construct a second, third one, let alone linearly many of it. But if I decide to do this instead, this is a different Hamilton cycle on the graph, and that has the lovely property that all the edges have different lengths. So I can rotate it, I can rotate it, and after literally many of those rotations, I start getting a dense collection of Hamilton cycles. Um, so now I'll tell you, I'll tell you sort of a minimal set of things that one should know about degree conditions and graphs forcing the existence of Hamilton cycles. The first one is a whatever it is, third theorem in the undergraduate course in graph theory. Um, it's a theorem due to the rack, which showed that in an n vertex graph, if every vertex has a degree at least n half, then that has a Hamilton cycle. And that's what we teach the standard graduates. This is for the existence of a single one. In terms of finding dense collections of these guys, um, this is, um, yeah, I've given this at our homework, so it's an undergraduate exercise to show that the edge set of the complete graph can be, in fact, decomposed completely into edges joined on the cycles 
and then algebra is not enough to get breaks on difficult definitions of decomposition or something, and think this way. Like this, this is it. You just need to split the edges. Um, so this is the second exercise of the slides. But if you're more observant, you'll notice that I just proved this, like so. Um, I've actually seen a, I've seen an induction proof of that as well. Um, now, following this, given that it's so easy, one could ask, how many edges can I take away from the complete graph and have this property still remain true, that the result would always be decomposed onto Hamilton cycles? That's known as the Hamilton decomposition conjecture. Not a conjecture since 2016, so quite difficult, I suppose. Um, that says that if we have an n vertex graph which is d regular, where d is at least n half, so that's the same as Dirac's theorem, but the graph has to be regular. Um, then the resulting graph will always be decomposable into edge to join Hamilton cycles. And there's a little asterisk here because I'm, I'm omitting a lot of details. Let me give one of those details. So if D is odd, it is impossible that it decompose the graph into Hamilton cycles because they all have <coughs> even degrees everywhere. Um, so in that case, the conclusion of the theorem is Hamilton cycles plus one perfect match for those of you that have seen this thing. Um, so the asterisk is due, due to a bit of details. Um, and things get extremely confusing for directed and oriented graphs, but I'll talk about this later. <coughs> now there's another, there's another large substructure that works with a lot, um, which is the tiling, which might be something you've not seen before. So if I have a fixed little graph f, a perfect f tiling in, a, in, a, in the large graph, it's simply a spanning collection of vertex disjoint copies of this little graph. So here's an example. If f is this house, then a perfect tiling of 25 vertices consists of five houses. So you can think of stuff as like triangle tilings or k4 tilings with this guy and so on. So, now I'll do a similar survey of kind of degree connections <coughs> to the existence of these things in graphs when the graph I'm tiling with is complete um, in kind of a special case. So, um, in, in terms of uh, trying to find a, a single tiling with complete graphs of our vertices, this has been known since the 70s. Hanno and Semrady showed that every n vertex graph whose minimum degree is at least this, this quantity contains a perfect tiling with copies of KR. And again, there's some details missing here, but maybe, you know, Browning points to whoever points that out, um, what the detail is. This is kind of a similar quantity to what we saw in the trans there, but boosted up by one step. Um, here I've inserted a bit of self-promotion because I've actually worked on extensions of this theorem a lot, so I really like it. Um, I've, uh, I've worked on two separate projects that give extensions of this theorem. Um, we're able to show that the, the degree condition can be proved slightly if the host graph is forced to not have large empty vertex sets. Those are called independent sets, for those of you who have encountered this before. Um, so basically, it's like imposing an extra condition on the host graph, and then suddenly the degree condition can be made weaker. Um, and then also a very exciting rainbow extension of it of which this is a direct consequence, so really as just an extension of the theorem. Okay, what about finding um, dense collections of tilings in the, in the complete graph? That's the natural second question I asked before. Um, that was also known since the 70s, so Red Chadbury and Wilson showed that indeed the complete graph on n vertices can be perfectly decomposed into perfect tilings with KR. And here in brackets, I have like an important statement. A slight, not slight, an extension of this to hypergraphs, again, for those of you who have um, encountered this before. Uh, an extension of this for hypergraphs was a big deal and a big conjecture in, in combinatorics. It was known as the existence of resolvable designs, and it was only proved by PTK Batch in 2018. So it was, a, it was a very complicated paper. There were some algebraic approaches in it. It was, um, he submitted it to annals and then they, they sent it back because they said it was too complicated so nobody could understand it. Like, it was not an easy thing to prove. Excuse me. Yeah. This no, 
do it imply to uh, large entities exchanges only or also to no rental exchanges? Uh, oh, the these no, are two separate things. No large entity exchanges? Is yes, one so condition and the other is to have rainbow exchanges? Mm -hmm. um, no, these are two different papers. Ah. So from the plus on the left hand side is what okay. we proved in one okay. paper and on the right hand side is a different okay. paper. Thank so you. it's not one as well. Um, so, you know, with, with, with um, Hamilton Cycles, I was able to go one step further and tell me that the complete graph is not something I need for this for decomposition. But here things kind of, in the tiny world, run out very quickly. So here we get a lot of stuff that's been over for a long time. Uh, even for r equals 3, so even in the triangle case, um, note that a decomposition of a graph into k3 tidings, so into triangle tidings, is automatically a decomposition into triangles. So I look at each tiding and I just take each triangle separately, and that becomes a triangle decomposition. Uh, but the minimum degree that forces the existence of a triangle decomposition in a graph is not known. It's been conjectured since the 70s by Nash Williams, who is one person, that the those are not two people, um, that minimum degree three, three quarters n forces every graph to have um, a triangle decomposition. There has been some recent progress on this. Maybe the best thing is like 0 0.8, about 0 0.8, and we're going for 0.75. But this is just an illustration where in this field things become from trivial to very difficult very quickly. Um, that was the end of my survey. So here I, I included a non, very much non-exhaustive list of methods we use in, in my work. Maybe some of you will relate with some of those. Um, so we use lots of probabilistic techniques, things like concentration inequalities, Chernoff's inequality, Markov's inequality, and a bunch of things like this. Um, and also a bit of martingales as well. Um, we use a very powerful tool as well that's been around since the 90s called uh, Simradius Regularity Lemma. Um, and I say with applications in combinatorial number theory because I think it was he first developed it to prove that every subset of the integers with positive upper density contains arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length. So that might be you know, familiar to some. Um, another tool that I use in, in my work is the flag algebra method. So it contains the word algebra there. Um, which is quite recent, it was not very old. And um, a tool maybe that I use more often than the flag algebra is uh, the absorption method. But the latter two are the two methods I'll be trying to illustrate for the rest of the talk. Um, conveniently, because I've got the two methods separate. If you get lost or get bored during the first bit, you just need to wake up for the second. So the first problem is on edge to join triangles. So you can keep in your head the, for example, Nash Williams' conjecture and how you know difficult it must have been to prove if we didn't manage. And that's the that's the flag algebra problem. So recall that the complete graph can be decomposed into triangles. That's a direct consequence, say, of the triangle tiling decomposition thing. It was uh, Ray Chadbury and Wilson, but also you can just believe in that it's true. Um, and also, we know from the first couple of slides that graphs with n squared over four edges can contain potentially no triangles. So, in the in the first case, I can I can say that the graph has edge density one because it contains all the edges it can possibly contain. And in the latter case, the graph has edge density a half, so remember this notation. It has edge density half because it contains half the edges it could possibly contain. And of course, one could ask what happens in between. And that was answered to some extent in um, the 60s in a paper of Erdős Gödmann and Pasha for all Hungarian, maybe apart from the middle one. Um, they showed that if we have an n vertex graph, which has d times n choose two edges. So sort of extrapolating from the beginning, this will be a graph with edge density d. d is just a real number between 0 and 1. Density concept. Then that would contain at least half times d minus half n choose two edges to join triangles. 
close the sanity check, let me maybe take these numbers one and half up here and substitute and see what I get. So if I take a half and I put this in here, I get zero. Uh, which is what I should get because at edge density of half, I can guarantee no traffic this. Um, but if I put d equals 1, so that's the complete graph case, then uh, this factor here becomes a quarter, so a half times a half, it's a quarter. And here's sort of a napkin calculation. A complete graph has edges, two edges, each triangle has three edges, so I have a third time times entries to edges in the triangle to um, triangles in the triangle to composition. So each one occupies three edges. Um, and it's definitely not a quarter, so the theorem is not tight there. It should do better. Um, and in some subsequent work, during to the conjecture that in fact the correct factor here shouldn't be a half and two, uh, but it should be two thirds. And now if I plug in d equals one, I actually get the correct number, which is hopefully you know, should be true. Um, so in some work of a few years ago, we were able to prove this, and indeed this, this constant here can be improved to two thirds. Um, now there's a little asterisk here, which uh, indicates limited details. We actually proved what is called an asymptotic result. Uh, so we proved this with a little error term. So we have at least, we're proving something slightly weaker, by introducing an arbitrary small quadratic error term. And maybe don't worry about the details on what that exactly means. But um, the asterisk was also in the original conjecture, because the original <coughs> conjecture was also asymptotic. And uh, in the next year, with a different um, set of authors, not disjoint, we're able to actually get rid of the error term. And as a sort of good extremal graph theorist, we also classified all the extremal examples, which is what we should be doing. So how do, we, how do we go about proving something like this? Um, now, for the, to give you a little flavor of the methods that we use, and I, I told you already we use the flag algebra method, so there's something I want to break about it. I'll try and prove to you, um, not very rigorously, a consequence of this result. So the consequence of this is that if I substitute d equals strictly greater than a half, then I will get a positive number of triangles which really is just mantles there. And if I have edge density just strictly greater than half, I must contain at least one triangle. So I'll try and give you a, okay, I call it proof by vibes because it won't be rigorous, but I think if you go home with a cup of tea and try and reconstruct a real proof from what you see, you'll be able to because it's really not, it's not far from being rigorous at all. Um, so to do this, I'll give, I'll introduce a bit of picture notation that I'll be using throughout. So by a single edge, in a graph I just denote the number of edges in the graph normalized by inches 2, so that's always a real number between 0 and 1. And the assumption of Mantos theorem is, is, is that the edge is strictly greater than half. Um, the same thing can be done with triangles, and that's the consequence of Mantos theorem. So the triangle refers to the density of triangles in the graph, which is the number of them divided by n choose 3. Again, I normalize it appropriately. Um, so that it's between 0 and 1, so the consequence is that that would be greater than 0. So we start the proof. Suppose for contradiction that edge is greater than half and triangles is equal to 0. Um, now, this is the most difficult thing in the whole talk. So, um, for every vertex in a graph, if I take its degree and take choose 2, that's equal to the, to the number of edges in its neighborhood plus the number of non edges in its neighborhood. Because everything in the neighborhood of a vertex is either an edge or a non edge. Um, and this can be written in pictures like so. Like so. So, V is a little square. Um, then the degree of E all squared, so the number of edges containing V, is equal to the number of triangles containing V. If you think about it, that's counting the number of edges in V's neighborhood. Plus the number of, let's call it cherry, the number of cherries having V as, as their degree two vertex. And again, if you look at it, this is just counting the number of non-edges in the neighborhood of V. Um, 
then this holds and um, you might ask where that factor of two, two disappear to, that disappears due to the way that things are being normalized. So again, this is the details you have to fill, fill up um, over a cup of tea. Um, so this holds. So let me take that and average it over all vertices in my graph. Now on the left hand side, I have an average of a bunch of squares, which I believe by Jensen's inequality is greater than the square of the average. Um, and the average overall vertices in the graph of their degrees is counting really the edges in the entire graph. So what's on the left hand side is, is um, the edge density squared. And by assumption, this is greater than a half, so this is greater than a quarter. Yeah. Now on the right hand side, I'm averaging things like triangles contained on a single vertex. And again, up to normal, the way that these things are normalized, on the right hand side, I'm just getting the counts of these subgraphs. So I get something like this. And the phantom factor is due to my normalizing factors. Um, so I get this inequality, but by assumption, the triangle is equal to zero, right? Um, so I get that the cherry is greater than three quarters. Um, and if you think about it, this is a really high density for a subgraph um, to, to exist at. Three quarters of the three vertex subgraphs in my graph look like this. So, um, and now I'll cheat a bit by using a theorem as opposed to proving things from scratch. Um, in 1960, Goodman proved that in any graph, the triangles and non-triangles renormalize, sum up to at least a quarter. So this is a bit like saying the edges and the non-edges in the graph sum up to one, but the triangle version of it. Um, and now finally we're one step away from proving Mantel's theorem for, for ourselves with pictures. Uh, mind that the sum of all possible, all four possible graphs on three vertices is one. Now this is just the law of total probability. If I sample three vertices in a graph at random, I'll get exactly one of these four pictures with probability one. So this is this. But then now this is a contradiction because on the left hand side I'm summing something superior to greater than three quarters and something which is at least a quarter. So the end. And on Goodman's bound, actually I can prove that by pictures as well, but I didn't include it. So Goodman's bound can be proved by considering a slightly different averaging of a square expression. Now this was a flag algebra proof, and I, I've included a slide with some high level information about how this stuff works. So the flag algebra developed by Rasparov um, in the mid-2000s consists of former linear, formal linear combinations of graphs. So what you saw just now, I was doing that. Um, now to, for this to be an algebra, I need to be able to multiply graphs together, which again you saw because I had things like edge squared. Uh, but also I need, I'll, I'll be taking to create kind of a richer structure in the algebra. I'm taking appropriate quotients, such as this one, that you saw before, uh, to ensure that when I do arithmetic in the flag algebra, then I'm, I can translate this very easily directly to proofs that are valid about graphs. Um, so recall the Goodman's band that I used just now as a black box a little bit, and the fact that I told you I could prove it by evaluating an expression in the flag algebra. Now technically, uh, no deity was giving this expression to me. Uh, there's no way I could come up with it unless I try all the options. And in fact, different linear combinations of the edge and the non-edge graph could potentially give me worse bounds. They could give me weaker theorems than Goodman's bound. Um, and this is this is where the real power of the flag algebra method comes in. The proofs, flag algebra proofs, always follow the same formula with certain choices made in between, and the way that these choices are made can actually be optimized with a computer. So our theorem that we proved, the first one that I quoted, it was technically a computer that proved it. It generated the correct expression that needs to be evaluated to prove the bound that we need. Um, as sort of for some historical information, I'll tell you why Rasmus bothered to do all of this. Um, he, shortly after uh, devising the method, he used it to give the minimum number of triangles in a graph with edge density d. So it's the same setting. I've got an average graph, 
d times edges to um, edges, so that's edge ends t to e. And then there's this monster expression for how many triangles it is forced to at least have. Um, for, and this was a big deal when it came out. I don't know necessarily why, but it was apparently of interest to Nocom and Achardis because this was also an animal's paper. Uh, for, for contrast, our theorem kind of gives a similar thing, a similar bound, but for the, the existence of edge joint triangles. And um, the expression that's here at the front, so 2 thirds d minus half, is the best linear expression that we could have there. But it's by no means the best expression we could have there, period. So potentially, you know, higher order terms here do exist, and that what they, what they exactly are is very much open still. They could look like this. Was that okay for proofs and in slides? Yeah. I was a bit nervous about sort of like people get scared when you write proof in a bunch of slides. <laughs> um, so now I go to the second problem, and whoever was asleep can wake up for it. Um, the second problem was what I told you that so far that Hamilton cycles in graphs which are directed are kind of confusing, and this will be trying to describe what's confusing about it. So the second half is about a problem on directed Hamilton cycles in graph. Um, so recall from before, that was um, the second exercise I had, that the edge set of the complete graph can be decomposed into edge to Hamilton cycles. That was the, the cool picture where they start to rotate. We know that this holds. Now there's a directed version of this exact same thing, which is not very much not an exercise anymore. It's known as Kelly's conjecture uh, from the late 80s. So Kelly conjecture that the edge set of every complete regular tournament, which I did not like this with an arrow, can be decomposed into edge to Hamilton cycles. So same, um, same conclusion. This is what the complete regular tournament looks like. So it's a complete graph whose edges are oriented so that each vertex has as many edges coming out of it as are coming in, and they're both n half. Um, and a Hamilton cycle in this graph now has to obey the directions of the edges. In particular, if I were to delete all the arrows, the exercise above is a consequence of as a consequence of this conjecture. Now, fortunately, this is no longer a conjecture since 2013, when uh, Danielle Kuminder also has proved it. This is, this is the same conjecture slash now theorem again. There is a bipartite analog of the same kind of result, which is due to Jackson and um, from slightly earlier, actually, when Kennedy's conjecture was made for the day. So Jackson conjectured that the edge set of every complete regular bipartite tournament, slightly different notation for that, can be decomposed into edge to join Hamilton cycles. So this is what the bipartite tournament looks like. You can probably extrapolate from the previous picture. So it's a complete balanced bipartite graph. All the edges are arrows, and each vertex sees as many co coming out as it does coming in. These, if you think about it, are all necessary conditions for the existence of decomposition of Hamilton cycles because of the way they are. Um, now, this is the same theory again for the third time. As before, I will ask, do we really need the graph to be complete for this to hold? Can we do away with some of the edges and still maintain the same property that the result, as long as it's regular, then it will be decomposable into whatever I want. And uh, luckily, um, Kunin also is improving Kelly's conjecture, we're able to answer this for the complete graph. Um, they were able to answer it for sort of the non-bipartite case. Uh, they actually showed that if we have a D-regular oriented graph, where D is at least 3 eighths n plus a little error term, then indeed one can decompose this into Hamilton cycles. And now this implies Kelly's conjecture because a half is greater than 3 eighths. So there. Um, the, the complete the tournament, the, the regular tournament that you saw a couple slides ago, which is the special case, satisfies the assumptions of this thing. 
for the bipartite case, a co-author of mine and I, um, I need to leave it now to my co-author, we made a conjecture that actually the, the correct degree should be n over 8, <coughs> due to the kind of extra imposed structure that the graph is bipartite. So there's a bit of a structure there that I impose, um, potentially forbidding some bad examples. And uh, we, proved, we proved the result to support this conjecture, which is essentially the same thing, but very asymptotic, with a bunch of errors in it, all pointed out in red. Um, much as it was with Kelly's conjecture, we need the degree to be strictly greater than n over 8, even if it is by arbitrary degree. But also, we, we, we construct not a complete composition, but rather a kind of a dense connection that covers all but an arbitrarily small proportion of the edges. And lastly, our Hamilton cycles aren't really Hamilton cycles. They've got length kind of n minus n divided by polylog. So that is you know, arbitrarily long again. This result doesn't look so great, I'm sorry. We have a better looking result that is just all on the slide. Like when I say there's three errors in the result, that's but it's actually, it's, it's really great support that this is potentially true, or if it's not true, there's some interesting kind of limiting behavior happening there. Because why would this be true, and this will be true if you want. Um, how would we go about proving this? Now this is the second method I'll try and give you a feel for. Um, we use the method of absorption for that. Um, and this has been a central method, sort of Kelly's conjecture was proved by this, the Hamilton decomposition conjecture was proved by this. There are certain results kind of on the existence of designs that have also been proved like this. So really, this, this is a method quite versatile that resolved a lot of long-standing conjectures in the field in the past maybe 10 years. Um, so what does this method do? So, I'll give a bit of motivation. Uh, building a Hamilton cycle in a graph, due to the fact that it has to traverse all the vertices, often looks like this. So it looks like this chap who was trying to paint, paint his floor, and then he got painted into the corner. Because if I'm trying to, in an inverted graph, if I'm trying to build a structure that has any vertices itself, at the beginning I'm quite free, I can use a lot of structure in the graph, but then towards the end I have to close it. I have to close the Hamilton cycle. And I get less and less freedom as I progress in building it. So at the end, I might end up like this and not be able to close my Hamilton cycle. With absorption, um, constructions of Hamilton cycles look more like this. So it's the person who cleverly is painting towards the door, so that they wouldn't, they would be able to kind of finish the paint job because they planned ahead. They thought about what they would do at the end before they started. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like when I'm trying to build a Hamilton cycle. So what does it mean to paint towards the door when making a Hamilton cycle? Um, so, and it's all pictures. So this is really the graph in which I'm trying to build a Hamilton cycle. For a theorem, this graph is bipartite, but nothing of what I draw will be bipartite itself, just for display purposes. So you can think in the back of your head that this graph is actually bipartite, but it's um, now, uh, to, do an, to do an absorption construction of a Hamilton cycle, what I need to do is two steps instead of one. I'll be constructing an almost Hamilton cycle first, and then I'll be closing it with something that I plan for, something that I plan for in the beginning. Now, what's a ha almost Hamilton cycle? What would that be? For our purposes, it's a uh, collection of paths. Now, sort of for, for to, get, to give you a bit of a feel, the graph has n vertices. There are about log n of these paths. So really, they're quite long. On average, their length is n divided by log n. But you know, there are very few of them. And we, we can construct something like this quite easily, actually. This is not part of what I'm And um, to do, to do our absorption before we did this, we set aside a special set of vertices that will be helping me make these paths into a cycle. 
Um, and it doesn't actually, this, the set doesn't need to be that special at all. Uh, because all I need it to be is inherit some of the degree conditions of the graph that I had to start with. And then it needs to be kind of well connected with the stuff on the left. And that can be done by choosing it a parameter. There's nothing special about the set at all. So suppose I found these uh, this sort of collection of paths. They, they're spanning the bit of this apart from the, the end of the A. Now, because these paths are well connected with the set at the end, I'm able to generally greedily find edges that point from the ends of these paths, so from the tops, into the special set, and then from the special set to the beginnings of the this is not even, it's not even something to prove, it's a greedy choice of edges. And now in here, I'll be trying to do something to close the cycle. Now what, what do I need to find there? Well, I need to find paths that somehow connect the red paths into one long thing. So they'll look like this. The first vertex gets connected to the second one on this side. The second vertex gets connected to the third one. And then the last one, don't read this yet, the last one gets connected to the first one on the bottom side. So if I were to traverse these edges, I will get something long. So I start from this path, then I go into the green path, I follow this guy, I go back into the large bit, I follow the second red path, go into the, the little set, traverse the second green path, go back to that guy, and then go back here, and now this closes into a cycle. Now if I did this with all the paths as opposed to just three, then I will get a Hamilton cycle. Um, now for our theorem, these green paths aren't actually, they don't actually span on the vertices, so I get the error in the Hamilton cycle from that. And um, because of this two-path construction of the cycle, I'm actually able to do this many times in an edge to joint fashion to find a decomposition. Because I need to do this once and then remove it and do it again, and remove it, do it again, and remove it, do it again. The fact that I'm doing it in such a kind of two-pass way lets me actually do this ultimately. What happens in the green to construct the green paths is actually the last exercise of, of the talk. And it's not, I wouldn't call it an undergraduate exercise, but I think it's kind of a First year graduate student exercise, maybe. Um, so, for the for everybody's afternoon, try and show that if a graph G has m vertices, it's balanced by partite oriented. So, picture that we saw before with the two two vertices. Assuming that each vertex has in degree and out degree at least m over eight, that was the condition that we had in the theorem. Then show that the graph is strongly connected. This means that between any two, now computer scientists will probably know this. This means that between any two vertices in the graph, I could find a path going from one to the other, and also from the second to the first. Okay, I see a few nods, so some people have done computer science. So that was it. I hope that you know, it wasn't that difficult to follow, at least with the pictures. I just want to recap what we learned from all these random results put together in slides. Um, first thing we we'll learned is what extreme of combinatorics is. It's, it's all about finding extreme of graph parameters subject to constraints. We also learned that especially interesting a condition is for forcing the existence of large substructures, so things that are spanning or things that are dense. We also learned about the flag algebra method, which was used to give the minimum number of triangles in a graph with a given number of edges. <coughs> and that this could be used to give something similar about the minimum number of edge disjoint triangles. That was our result. Um, on absorption, we learned that my favorite paper is this method to find spanning or dense substructures in graphs, and I've got, I've got work on both. And um, I don't know, last but not least, that Hamilton cycle decompositions and oriented graphs are extremely confusing. And 
that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm not aware of other methods. What's not so good about it is that computers only give approximate solutions because they only have finite, what is it, approximation power. So what's not so good about you know, using computers is that often one can't actually, they only give you sort of solutions up to the machine of Salem. And at times that actually, you know, translating that to a actual proof is, I, I know of results that have been proved kind of computationally, but they weren't able to be rounded up to the machine of Salem in a way to actually produce a valid theorem, so I think it's bad about it. Do you use some uh, machine realization, computer realization of this method? Yeah, yeah, so one needs to write, some, I can tell you some key words, semi-definite programming. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain matrix that we're looking for uh, to plug into our proof, our flag algebra proof, and that matrix needs to be positive semi-definite, so we need to formulate um, whatever it's called, semi-definite program, like a computer scientist can disagree on what it's called. Um, we need to formulate a semi-definite program. So in terms of the machinery used, all you need to do is write down a semi-definite program and then plug a solver and make it solve it. That's it. So actually in terms of the coding required, it's really not as long and complex it's as one of the So all, all, you, all the work you need to do is to define it which is not a lot of work, and then packages exist that will solve it for you, that's all you need. And please, is this a computer realization uh, is free of charge? Or? Oh, yes, it exists. I think one free version of it exists, it's called Flagmatic. Um, I think it's based some it's posted somewhere in the US, but yeah, I think some free distributions exist. As far as I know, most people have their own distribution that they use for themselves because they know how it works. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.